Hey, I'm Carl Willis, and I just got myself a little present in uh, celebration of Nuclear Science Week. Actually, that's just a convenient excuse, but uh, I got myself a uh, nice little antique, and it is blazing hot. That's hot. That is hot. Anyway, let's go check this thing out. It's pretty cool. The first thing I'm going to do is put on some gloves because this is going to be a particularly spicy item and we would just want to be careful. Well, uh, and we've got some writing in there. This radiumizer, as now prepared, gives off approximately 30,000 Mach units of emanation per liter every 24 hours. And it says it's made by the Rocky Mountain Radium Products Company. And keep it in a cool place. This device is what was called an emanator. And at the uh, sort of the 1910s, 1920s, this was a very popular sort of quack medical device. The idea was it would put radon, or emanation as they called it back then, into drinking water. So the basic idea is you had a container of radium, that would be the one here on the left. You would blow air through it where it would pick up radon, which is the decayed daughter of, uh, of your uh, radium. And then you would blow that air into a, a, another container that had your drinking water in it. And then you would drink this to sort of uncertain health benefit. Um, in fact, we now know there is no health benefit to drinking or eating radioactive material. And in the, uh, in the thing here, we actually have the, um, that's going to be your mouthpiece. So let's talk about how this crazy thing worked. You've got the jar on the left, and this contained your radium solution in the bottom of the outer part. And there's a bubbler type air filter in the middle of this bottle. So your air would come in, it would go through this filtering medium, and we'll talk about the chemistry later, uh, and then it would enter into the radium water, and there's a little hole. Let's see if we can see this hole. Little tiny hole in the bottom of the glass in the center of the, the filter, and that's where your air would come out and bubble through the radium solution. And your radium in solution was probably a radium chloride acidified with a little bit of HCl to avoid precipitation. And it was probably carried on barium. So all these crystals in the bottom are probably barium chloride with a radium included. Um, after your air passed through there, it would pick up radon, the decay daughter. It would sparge that out, carry it out through your stopcock. And then the patents and uh, other diagrams of these things you've, that I've been able to find show that air coming directly into our water bottle. And as long as our stopper's in place here, that air will bubble through our drinking water and deposit radon daughters, as well as a little bit of radon itself in the water. And uh, so when you suck on the mouthpiece, which is normally connected with a piece of rubber hose, but all that is dead and destroyed just from age. But when you suck on this, you draw water up and of course drink it and it would be displaced with air that then was brought over from the other container. And we've got this bladder thing. I don't know what the bladder does. It's not shown on any, on any of the uh, patent uh, diagrams or other literature that I've been able to find. And it's kind of a piece of junk because natural rubber just degrades like that. But I suspect that went between our stopcock and our inlet 
into the drinking water container and sort of acted as a filter. So if you aspirated water or solution from the radium container, it would get caught in the bottom of this. And on the other side, if you blew water backwards from your drinking water container, it would get trapped out. So this is, this is just like a, you know, a, a, a flask trap that you might use in a filtration or something. Um, it's got an inlet and an outlet, and I suspect it sat, as I mentioned, between these two. So, thinking about the chemistry here, why would you want an air filter? Well, probably because you want to keep from forming insoluble or minimally soluble radium compounds that would keep you from getting the most contact between your airstream and the radium. So this would decrease the efficiency of getting the radon out of that solution. So probably what's in that inner trap would have been uh, some strong base, perhaps uh, lime water, perhaps uh, sodium hydroxide, something like that. So if you're bringing in CO2 from outside air, you're going to trap those, uh, uh, trap that stuff as carbonate before it's able to cause precipitation of the carrier, the barium, or the radium itself as a carbonate, for instance. Or if there's, you know, acidic sulfurous gases uh, in the atmosphere, this would trap those as well and keep them from forming the insoluble sulfates of those materials. You can see these containers are made out of the same glass. In fact, they're made by the same company, um, and they're the same size and everything, but the one on the left that has all of the uh, radium in it has turned a lovely amethyst shade, and uh, this is a another signal that the radioactivity here is actually pretty high. Uh, we're actually seeing radiation damage to the glass. That's what's causing it to turn purple. In a lot of these old uh, glass compositions, you had some trace manganese as a decolorizing agent, and uh, when radiation interacts with the manganese in the glass, it produces that lovely uh, purple hue. Uh, but this is definitely an indication to us that we need to be careful because there's a fairly large amount of radioactivity. What I'm expecting to find is that this is going to be the majority of our activity, and it's really going to be pretty high. Uh, we're probably going to see very not very much activity over in the drinking water one because the progeny of radon decay for the most part rather quickly. Up in the top of the box is some very detailed instructions on how to use this device and it tells us how much radioactivity it supposedly has in it. It says that part one of the radiumizer, which is the cell that emits radium emanation or as we know it now radon, the radium element content of 120 micrograms and an equivalent or an equilibrium activity of 120 microcuries or 320,400 maca units. Okay. We wouldn't consider this a point source, but we're just going to sort of estimate the activity as best we can. So we got a 30 centimeter distance, and if I zoom in on the ion chamber, it looks like sort of about uh, I don't know, 70, uh, point, point 0.7 to point 0.75, somewhere in that vicinity, uh, millirentgens per hour. And doing the math on that, um, if this were a point source, it would come in at uh, a bit less than the 120 microcuries we're expecting. But uh, because it's a distributed source, I'm going to say that for all practical purposes, we have about 120 microcuries there. Um, give or take a little bit. Uh, and the other thing to note is that the radium may not be in equilibrium with its daughters in this jar because all of these stoppers are pretty crummy. Um, this, is, uh, this is in here, this is loose. Uh, I can actually turn that in there. Uh, this thing turns in there. So the stopper's in very poor condition uh, and we may not be in equilibrium. But yes, we're looking at about uh, three quarters of a millirentgen per hour at 30 centimeters. So how old is this uh, radiumizer emanator product? Well, we have a couple clues, um, one of which is the fact that it was patented, uh, or the patent was applied for in 1916, granted in 1919, and the jars here provide another clue these are uh, Whittle and Tatum 
or Whittle Tatum Company, and you can see that particular mark there. Uh, and luckily, we can date these jars based on that label, and we know that these jars were made between 1901 and 1924. So if I had to guess, I would say this apparatus was probably manufactured between 1919 and 1924. Some more context, radium at that time was fairly expensive, and so to have the sort of content uh, that's in this jar, 120 micrograms, this would have been a very expensive item in its day. Um, this was not some little radium trinket uh, or some small item that had a nominal amount of radium. This was really meant to do the job, <laughs> and um, as such, it, it contained a high activity and uh, would have sold for a fairly large amount of money in its time. Uh, finally, of course, we have to talk about safety with things like this. Uh, we don't want to keep something like this in the house, especially in this state where we have deteriorating stoppers and, you know, open, uh, open connections into the interior because radon gas is continually coming out of this. So we want to put this in some sort of sealed container and then we want to store it in a dedicated space that has uh, some radiation shielding and is not uh, inside the house. So that's what we're going to do with this item. I've got a, um, I've got a uh, container here that I think will work pretty well for us from uh, good old Target. So we got a hermetically sealed container and I'm guessing this is going to be about the right size to get our high activity bottle in. So let's just see if it fits in there. That looks like that'll be a pretty good fit. And my guess is that within a short period of time, a few days, we will see radon dotters all over the inside of this container. But that's a good thing because it means they're not coming out into building air and getting all over everything. Um, and uh, this is really probably the most important step for people who own something like this. Get it in some sort of a hermetic container. And then, of course, you don't want to be right next to these things. If they got 120 microcuries of activity in them, you want to get some distance between this item and you. So why did people want to drink radioactive water? What was the rationale behind this? Um, obviously, this is quack medical device. This is not uh, representative of scientific understanding. Uh, but there was a kernel of truth to the fact that radium had health benefit. It's just that it was found to be useful as a external radiation source for treating cancer specifically. And in the mindset of quacks, um, if the agent is good in one mode of use, let's say externally outside the body, then it must be really good if you bring that agent inside the body. And uh, all of a sudden we can start to get a hint of why you know, what the mindset is for why people would do something like this. Because in our own time, of course, we have our illustrious president who talks about bringing the light inside the body for, uh, you know, coronavirus disease and what have you. Um, well, it was the same motivation, really. Uh, there was this one therapeutic agent with a particular mode of use that was really miraculous at the time. And so the selling point for these radium quack cures was Let's bring that agent inside the body, and instead of just treating cancer, let's apply it to all of these maladies that, that really uh, did not have good, effective, or convenient cures at the time. So things like, you know, sexual health, or longevity, or beauty, or, uh, you know, mental health. These were the sorts of fixations that the quacks uh, picked up on when they sold these radium tonics. and. Uh, emanators and stuff of this nature. So that is the historical place of this thing. And by the way, I should mention, um, radioactive quackery is not completely dead, uh, but you're not going to find, you know, real hot stuff like this. You are going to be able to go on Amazon and buy uh, thorium-based negative ion generators and stuff like that and get that delivered to your door any day of the week. 
So that's modern radioactive quackery, but this stuff is, um, of course, from the heyday, and those times are well and truly gone. It's just important that we remember the philosophical or the, the um, psychological ground for, for the existence and proliferation of a product like this is not gone from society. We still have uh, challenges in our culture coping with the proliferation of quack medical devices. That's all for this one, guys. Uh, have a lovely nuclear science week. Get a lot of presents. Uh, stay safe out there. Don't get involved in quackery. That stuff might just kill you. We don't want to bring the light inside us. And uh, with that message out of the way, I will see you later in another video.